With winter fast approaching, it must be time for my very first autumn update. Hi, welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. Now, since the summer update, I've released six videos, mainly around the layout, but one in particular was visiting Culverlands, a, uh, a stay at home layout of a friend of mine. And I, to be perfectly honest, I think it was well received. And hopefully I intend to do those sort of once every six months. And if you're into that sort of thing, then please leave a comment to give me a little bit of a push to go out and get off my lazy backside and film someone else's layout. And of course, if you live in the West Country area or, you know, the deepest, darkest Somerset, as I always say, then drop me a line and perhaps I could come round and be um, a mutual benefit, come round and film your layout and perhaps give you uh, something to remember your layout by. Now, I have somewhat of a confession to make, and that is a friend of mine described himself as a butterfly modeler. And I thought to myself, a strange thing to say, but what he, what he meant was when he, he embarks on a certain project, he gets, let's say, 80% way through that project and then he flits like a butterfly to the next thing. And looking back over the last couple of years, I am clearly a butterfly modeler. And for an example of that here over by the viaduct, I was installing a signal, which I removed um, to do a little bit of wiring and clearly haven't bothered putting back. And over here, as the line runs up to the branch line station, I was doing a bit of work on the landscape and I painted a bit of the field in over the Celotex and clearly left it as it is. Furthermore, I've still yet to order my signals from Matt from Absolute Aspects and these little uh, orange marker dots show where the signals are going to go. But as quick as a flash, I've done absolutely nothing about it. And I think perhaps it's not just me, perhaps we all as railway modelers do this sort of thing. We go out and embark on one piece of track work and then we do this and then we do that. And I was talking to David Townend of McKinley uh, Railway yesterday and there should be a link up here to his channel. And um, I was talking about him perhaps doing a bit of landscape in his um, area known as Sheffield. And he, he turned around and said, no, absolutely not is I will not do any landscaping whatsoever until all the track is down and proven, tested, all the uncouplers, the RFID and all that kind of stuff. He won't start, you know, landscaping trees, buildings whatsoever. He does mock-ups, but nothing serious. And I thought to myself, <laughs> it's not a bad way of doing it really, is it? Because what I do is I progress a little bit, do a bit of track, wire it up, test it, do a hillside. And of course the track ends up sort of going into mothballs. Well, Hopefully, I'm going to change that. I do really intend now to get on with the track work. Now, Richard from Everard Junction did exactly this because when he built his new layout, he ripped the old one out and built that new fascinating construction he's got now. He laid all the track and now he's working his way around the layout doing the scenics, which makes perfect sense. Whereas I am a more of a butterfly modeler and I just flit from project to project. Well, let's put a line in the stand. No more. Now you may recall a couple of videos ago, I built this hillside, um, painted it up, but I also installed a, a roadway using um, paving tape and smoothed it from Woodland Scenics. Uh, since then, I, it, wasn't, it just wasn't smooth enough. So what I did is I added another layer of paving tape to the outside and built up um, another layer of the smooth it filler. <laughs> I still can't believe that, um, they sell that much of it because I believe you could just use draft excluder to give you the, the height and then just use ordinary filler in between. But it's an easy product to use and there's nothing wrong with it. And actually the filler isn't as expensive as I thought it was for the large container. It's only about five pounds, but there we are. I then peeled off the paving tape and that came away, obviously both layers, and that came away quite easily um, and then painted it, uh, the hillside with more of the brown to paint. And then after that, what I've done is I then just painted this road and not knowing what to paint it with, instead of embarking on expensive asphalt type paints, I went uh, back to my supply of Hobbycraft paints, um, mixed a bit of black with a bit of white, came up with a bit of gray, really slapped it on and it looks absolutely fine. And when I come around to doing the road properly, I will rub it down, give it another coat. I may well embark on a more of a tarmac -y feel for a bit of a prototypical view. Um, but for now, 
I needed to paint it grey because the, the white of the road was just stark and it just it was in my face, it was dreadful. Um, so this is now on hold um, and we move on to a different project. Now just to answer a couple of questions from a previous video. Now the last video I um, extended and modified this incline going up towards what would eventually be a Freightliner depot on the other side of the helix. And someone mentioned um, why don't I use the DCC Concepts power base um, to give locos more traction, obviously when there's magnets fitted underneath, should they struggle with the incline? And it was a fair point. And the reason I didn't use it on the first section is because I forgot. But I have some power base left over from the Helix. Um, if you're not into this sort of stuff, the reason you use it is you fit uh, magnets underneath your loco, which gives you more... Uh, grip as it were onto the rails because the stainless steel strips go underneath the track and if it is very it's quite straightforward just little bits of stainless steel really and you just pop them on the track and um, like I say with the, with the magnets it gives you more power now obviously when a loco goes uphill it needs more power and it's more inclined to slip of course when it goes through a curve a tight curve at that it will bleed even more speed and create more drag so it's it's more important really to put the power base on the curve than it is on the straight um, so I shall fit it into that section. Now someone else mentioned uh, in, a, in a comment what power do I use to power up what DC power supplies do I use to power up my um, Digitrack system well I'll be perfectly honest I use these this is made by Meanwell and it's a uh, 15 volt power supply it's an LS it's an LRS 100-15 um, and uh, if you're into these sort of things I'll leave a link on the the Amazon link down below but this is what I use but just be aware that these terminals do remain bare so if you've got kids around and underneath the baseboard if you poke your fingers in there you are going to pick up 240 volts AC sorry we're well, in this country anyway um, 240 volts AC. The input voltage is anywhere between 100 and 240 volts uh, AC, so it's both sides of the pond. Um, but just be aware that these terminals do remain um, unprotected, let's say. It's not rocket science, just put a bit of uh, plastic card over them, that'll do nicely. And you can secure it, it's got holes and all the rest of it, and a potentiometer to adjust the uh, the voltage. But that's what I use, and at the end of the day, it's not a bad purchase for under £20. So this is my first piece of track work is to progress up the incline with the uh, DCC Concepts power base uh, running along the incline up to the start of where my girder bridges will commence. Now I also mentioned in that last video about putting a bay platform in, a platform 3 to the station. And to that end what I intend to do is rip out this little piece of track work here and insert a Pico Code 100 electro frog medium radius left hand point and then that will allow it to feed over to there so we'll do that and I'm also going to rip out this um, double slip I don't need this double slip for this track to come down here um, I need this area here more as infrastructure to the station. I need the station building, I need car parking and what I'd originally thought would be a nice parcels line is a step too far. It doesn't really fit, it doesn't really work, it's not really that sort of realistic or prototypical as some say, so that's going to go. Um, quite interesting really because there are two point motors here and I'll only need one for the point that goes in here and that one point motor will go over to here so hopefully the cabling will reach. And now with a a couple of old bits of platform laid in place you can hopefully see the effect that I'm actually trying to achieve. Now in case you haven't seen this before this is a program known as AnyRail and sadly it's only available on PC but here you can see uh, the upper sections of the layout and if I choose to show the helix it's all done at a menu on the side and there you can see the helix so you can turn off various layers and see exactly what you need what you're sort of working on now if I zoom in a little bit and we look at the modifications that I'm planning to make here is the 
the double slip I spoke about removing because I don't really want this to run down into a track because the infrastructure for the station um, it will be in the way and then we spoke about putting in a, um, a, a bay platform in here which would be then platform three this being platform one platform two and then platform three so we would need to insert a point here so if I switch to the post so the double slip is now gone in goes the new point and here's the new piece of track work quite straightforward really but what does it bring to the show well having uh, thought about a nice shuttle if I zoom out a little bit and show oops the wrong way if I zoom out a little bit and show you the main layout so that shuttle here would come back out and it would naturally run up to the branch line station or of course it can then run down to the helix and then go back in um, underneath into the fiddle yard or do a complete loop come back up come to the branch line station and then back in as a fiddle so you can have uh, decent shuttle trains running using both the branch line station and of course platform three and of course your train can arrive at platform three a local passenger service would come into platform two and your passengers would obviously meet that connection and similarly when a plat train comes into platform one can decant passengers come across the footbridge jump onto the local service uh, through the uh, platform three and off they might trundle to the branch section the branch line station so hopefully you can see that just these couple of minor changes does make the um, the layout and its functionality more appealing so what's the problem with laying track then? After all, those couple of points and a bit of track, well, one and a half, two days work perhaps? Well, actually the problem is here in these two boards here known as board seven and eight, because these two boards go underneath that far corner and there is a great deal of track involved. And here, as you can see again on the AnyRail diagram, when I bring up this piece of track, you can see that it loops in to the existing fiddle yard. Now I need to build boards seven and eight prior to building board six, because if I put these in position, then I can fit in board six afterwards, because it's a simple evolution to put that one board in. Um, but to get these ones in after board six would make no sense whatsoever. But once these have been, um, the track's been laid, I'm, I'm faced with yet another major issue. And that problem is the electrics and electronics that are underneath this river board. Because when I first designed this area, there was going to be no fiddle yard. But of course now I'm faced with the dilemma that to maintain this board on the back wall will be very difficult. Trying to reach across a 28 inch board with both hands is clearly going to be an interesting evolution. The complexity, it's not, it's not that, that staggering really, it's just that it's um, time consuming. I could leave it all there, trim the board and fit these boards seven and eight, but it's the maintainability should things start to go wrong. Well, I've started thinning out this board now, and I think part of the problem uh, to do with my reticence really is I've got emotionally attached to it because it took so long to put in and it was a, a nice piece of work or so I thought I've always been reluctant to get in here and, and modify it but I've taken the shelf out I've taken the main pieces of hardware away so now what I think I'll do is take all this off take the board out and rethink a way ahead and I think what I'm leaning to do is or leaning towards is to make some kind of um, rack that's going to go underneath um, the, fiddle, uh, the, the fiddle yard board that was sit at about this level here and will have some kind of draw mechanism underneath. Well as you can imagine a few days have gone by since that last clip and in the meantime I removed all the components from the board and took out the board itself. Now two of those components the DS64 and the BDL168 needed to stay locally so I put the DS64 on the bottom of the river board and that controls the four points 44, 31, 42, 43 and 44 which switch the points either side of the river so that's underneath there and I can reach that from the outside. The BDL168 is a little more difficult because 
um, it does take a little bit more servicing when you want to change the blocks around if you're into all that block detection blah so in that case I made a little pop down uh, board there where it's only about 18 inches in from the edge of this board so I can actually get in there with two hands and maintain it so the two major components are installed we're sort of ready to go but now of course I've got to work on what I'm going to do with the other major components things like the PM42 uh, power district manager and of course the the main control boxes and of course the buzz bars that then feed out to the various circuits what exactly I'm going to do with those so I've been outside and cut that main board in half and I've got two 24 inch square boards and this one here is my cunning plan. Now I've drawn a, a line down the center and I've screwed in the four buzz bars for the four districts. The four districts are controlled by this PM42 with its four relays and the reason is if I get a short circuit on the, on the out, outer circuit then this relay makes and um, the power is taken from the outer circuit but these three other circuits remain working so your layout keeps going until of course you remove the short circuit from the outer and then it all works perfectly so it's a short circuit protection device so where do we go from here well obviously we need our power supply and this is a Digitrax DS240, uh, DCS240 and my idea then is for this side here, I've got further room to expand should I want another um, four power district with another PM42 at a later stage. I could also use it for SIG M20s or signal components or whatever. So that's my, my sort of cunning plan. So what I shall do now is remove these items and then put an edge around this board and also some wheels. As you can see, woodwork was never one of my favourite school subjects, but hey, we got it together. I haven't glued it at all because in case I change my mind, I want to take it apart because if I glue it, especially with Gorilla Glue, it won't come apart without tearing itself to bits. Well, that should just about prove beyond all reasonable doubt that I am no woodworker, um, but I have put a couple of, well, four reinforcing blocks in the corners to give it a bit more rigidity. Um, and these are the casters that I bought from B&Q, which if you're not from this country, B&Q stands for Block and Quail, and it's a sort of a popular DIY store. Um, anyway, those will go on the corners and then give this access um, to come in and out and a little bit of lateral on it as well. Um, so I shall now continue with the wiring and then we'll stick the casters on, pop it under and see what it looks like. Now I must confess that wiring these boards up in situ like this at sort of table level. Nothing really could be much simpler. This is such a gift rather than laying underneath the uh, the layout boards trying to uh, put them together. This really is so straightforward. If you're a regular to the channel, you'll know that I use these ferrules and, uh, and crimps because it does stop the sort of flyaway copper little bits of cable getting everywhere. And the last thing you need is these tiny little bits of copper cable going into the next terminal sort of thing. So using ferrules like this makes um, pretty perfect sense. I haven't used the ID tags on these. It's quite obvious where they're going, isn't it? You know that this is the helix and that's the fiddle so that's the basic power outputs from the four um, relays of the pm42 running into these four channels running into these four bus bars there we are so now i need to wire up um, the power in and the dc in which actually powers the board 
Well, here's the finished item. And as you can see, I've put an extension lead along the front. Um, here's a transformer that powers the PM42 and also the power taken off here to, to power the um, DCS240. And as you can see, there's a few cables going out now to the tracks on the outer and the inner circuit, the BDL158s um, and the inner and outer circuitry. There's also uh, an earth terminal. So now you can see the cables on the back which allow access um, to the back of the unit um, if the, when this fiddle yard's in place so you can get in on the side and carry out any maintenance or whatever or add another PM42, other component signal bits and bobs but you've got some slack on these cables to allow you to pull it out. So what does it look like in situ? Well does it all work? Well hopefully you can see a high neck gently moving away over the top of my head there. It didn't, it didn't work for the first time, I must confess. I'd missed off one lead. I just, it was part of the block detection, blah. Um, once I'd plugged that in, well, the power was restored. Um, there's the thing in situ. And obviously here's the next board for the fiddle yard. Um, I've got a few bits and bobs to do, um, running the loco net cables up to these remote uh, control bits and bobs and hopefully you can see here there's power back on the layout at 14.7 odd volts. Um, so there we are, I think it's quite successful and most of it is done. There are a few little bits because I've got to connect um, obviously when I build this fiddle yard into it and the existing um, left hand piece of the existing fiddle yard there has got to be plugged in but um, I know it was on about 80% of the thing before we flipped to something else but um, Persevering with this um, is a great step forward. I mentioned at the start of this video about becoming a butterfly modeler when we shift from focus from one job to another and don't really get anything completed. But what's this video really been about? Well, it's been about losing your mojo. I needed to sort that uh, board out there months ago, but I'd been avoiding it. I really didn't want to do it. It'd be such a drag. It's an, it's an incredibly awkward place to sit underneath there and, and do all that wiring. And because it was so hard, I then started on all these other little jobs where I was actually, I should have just knuckled down and got on with it. Now this thing has taken about four days to rewire, build that little drawer and pop it back in. So it's, it's not really the end of the world. It's, it's a kind of a week's work. Uh, it might not seem it because it's only a few wires and a bit of timber, but rest assured, it was a hard slog. But if you've got a little job like that and you feel like that you're losing your mojo, sometimes it is good to flit around and do something else until you kind of recharge your batteries and then you can face it. Or you can do something else. You can just knuckle down, shut up and get on with it, which is what I've done this time. Whatever the case, I do hope you found it interesting. And as usual, I'd like to thank the people that donate to the channel and, of course, my valued patrons. Thank you very much indeed. There's the old subscribe button. It's free, remember, and a video here and here. Take care, guys. See you in two weeks. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.